And uh, it's fitting that God has led us to that place in our worship today and our team, thank you, have led us so beautifully uh, to that place in our worship because we are starting a new series today for the next couple of months. It's called Rest and Feast. And uh, to put it simply, it's about the biblical principle of the Sabbath. And uh, so the title of today's message is Six and One. Six and One. Because the uh, command to observe Sabbath, I'm just still really enjoying that uh, little time of worship that we had, struggling to get my thoughts together. The... uh, the command to observe the Sabbath is actually one of the Ten Commandments. And uh, it's beautiful that in the last couple of months, as we've been digging deeper into the Bible and how to read the Bible, Luke brought us a great message. I can't remember what it was called, but you can go back and find it on the podcast, plug for the podcast, um, about learning to understand the Ten Commandments as given to us by God as more of a love letter, like a marriage contract between God and his people. And that when you take a deep dive into the way that that text has been written and the way that it's been put together and uh, the words that, that have been used in the original language, that rather than a set of rules given to a community of people being formed to follow God's way, it was actually more put together like a marriage contract and written in the same style as the ancient marriage contracts of two Jewish families coming together in a marriage. And so the people who are hearing the, this list of commandments for the first time there are words in that contract which which are recognizable to them as words and phraseology from a Jewish marriage contract and so I say all of that to say that when God gave us the Ten Commandments it was a loving list of um, agreements that he was asking us to come together to as a covenant, which is why when we look at Exodus 20, even in modern translations, uh, I mean, this isn't that modern, this is a very uh, accurate translation of the Bible, the New Living um, Translation, but it's called at Exodus 20, 10 commandments for the covenant community because it's a covenant that God is establishing with his people for the first time and he's showing them that if you can hold to these parts of the covenant then I have got so much abundance and blessing that I bring to the covenant relationship that you can trust me that your lives from now on are going to be so better than they ever so much better than they ever were before add to that the historical context of the fact that at this point in Israel's history they've just been brought out of 400 years of slavery in Egypt 400 years of being lesser than of being treated like the tail and not the head 400 years of having no agency, no authority over how they spent their time and what they did. 400 years, generation after generation after generation, so that all that I know, and even if I went to Ancestry.com and and tracked my family line back 400 years, all they have ever known is seven days a week of slavery every year of their lives for 400 years. And so at the time where God presents this loving document, this contract, this covenant to his people, we actually find that the command to observe the Sabbath is the longest of those commands. And there's some conjecture among theologians that perhaps the reason that there are so many words devoted to the observing of the Sabbath rather than do not murder is because it would have perhaps been the most countercultural thing on that list that he was asking those people to observe. And I would like to put it to you today that as we go in the outset of this series over the next couple of months, that if we dare to embark on a journey of building 
observing the Sabbath into our lives, it's perhaps the most countercultural thing you will embark on this year, maybe for the rest of your life. Let's go to the exact command there in the list of commandments. At verse 8, it says, Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. I mean, that's revolutionary. These people haven't had a day off in 400 years. No holidays, no trips to Disneyland, not one day off, not an, not an Australian two-day weekend every week, no, not one day off in 400 years. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons and daughters, one of the most egalitarian things written in scripture, countercultural, what? You, are you telling me that the women aren't the ones going to be running around preparing the meals on that day? Even the women get to rest? Your male and female servants, your livestock and any foreigners living among you. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea and everything in them. But on the seventh day, he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy He's saying, this is a part of the covenant I'm asking of you. I, know you. I know you're hard workers. You've proven yourselves. You're hard workers. You haven't had a day off in 400 years. I am giving you the opportunity to rest. Now, all of a sudden, 52 days out of every year, the whole community of people have been given the gift of rest, time, space, room, not just to breathe, but to remember that God is God and that he's modelled rest and he's created all of creation in patterns and seasons and rhythms so that we can live well and live abundantly and live free. He says in Ezekiel 20 verse 12, I gave them my Sabbath days of rest as a sign between them and me. It was to remind them that I am the Lord who had set them apart to be holy. You are set apart. And I want to put it to you that learning to observe the Sabbath day, some of you are already wrestling with it in your hearts. That's okay. We've got time. We've made room to hear from God on this subject because calling us back to the Sabbath is one of the ways that sets us apart from the rest of the world around us. When we are prepared to take a full day of rest, a 24-hour period of rest out of every seven, that's so countercultural, it requires us to place so much trust in God that everything that needs to get get done the other six days, we're allowing him to be Lord over. It's truly trusting God over our most limited resource, which is time. Some of you are giving me the fight that I, the pushback I can see it in your eyes that we sometimes get when we uh, invite people to go on a journey of learning to observe tithing, the the ancient principle of tithing. And they say, well, there's not much written in the New Testament about tithing. And I always say back to them, well, yes, if you go by New Testament rules, then it's giving everything away to the church and the community of faith. So by all means, I'm very happy for you to sign the deed of your house over to the church. We can empower that to happen. Um, But... There is a very interesting discussion in the New Testament about the Sabbath because Jesus healed on the Sabbath. I've had that argument too. Well, Jesus healed on the Sabbath, so it's no longer the law. Correct. It is no longer the law. But let's have a look at what Jesus said about the Sabbath in Mark 2. It says, One Sabbath day, as Jesus was walking through some grain fields, his disciples began breaking off heads of grain to eat. But the Pharisees, you know, that's the, that's the annoying group of people who are just always trying to trip Jesus up and try and make out like they're more religious, more holy, more spiritual uh, than 
the God of the universe. But anyway, uh, so they said to Jesus, trying to trip, trip, him, trip him up again, look, why are they breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath? Jesus said to them, haven't you ever read in the scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God during the days when Abiathar was high priest and broke the law by eating sacred loaves of bread that only the priests are allowed to eat. He's saying, you know, this guy David that you, you guys all look up to as this model of how to observe Jewish law, well, he himself went in and broke the law. And he also gave some to his companions. He didn't, he didn't observe the holiness of those loaves on the Sabbath day. And so Jesus' point is this, and here's what he said. The Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. He's saying the Sabbath is a gift for you. It's all about setting you free. It's not about asking you to observe a law. It's about giving you a gift of freedom, of space, of room, of time that the world tells you you haven't got so that you can put things back into order and you can observe what is holy. So the Son of Man, speaking about himself, is Lord even over the Sabbath. So I think you need a Sabbath. If Jesus was bold enough to declare it as still being of value, while obviously not being a law that you could be beheaded or have your hand chopped off for not doing, if he's still advocating for the Sabbath as he teaches those around him about the new way to live, then I want to propose that you need a Sabbath. All right, let's have a, I've got a funny image here. There's a guy called Pete Scazzaro. We're going to lean on some of his teaching. Uh, he's a pastor and a thought leader and has a great podcast called um, The Emotionally Healthy Leader. It's also a great book. Uh, anyway, we're going to go through some of his stuff, but he's written extensively on the Sabbath. Here's a slide that he's shared. You know you need a Sabbath. And this isn't the whole list, by the way. If you can say yes to any one of these things, it's possible you might need a Sabbath. So you know you need a Sabbath when the only time you're alone is in the bathroom. Mums. And like, who knows, you're not even alone there because they're banging on the door, even if you're able to shut the door and lock the door. Um, if it takes you over 30 minutes to fall asleep because your mind is racing about things you forgot to do. Guilty. Uh, you know you need a Sabbath when you think rest is standing still in traffic. Thank you, Jesus. I accept your rest at this red light for the next 15 seconds. Uh, you check your email for a moment and are still there an hour later. Luke Main? No? No takers? Um, you cannot remember anything you ate for the last three days. No? I mean, we heard a lot about Vietnamese food last week. Those guys were able to remember, so it must have been a restful trip. Um, you drove for an hour and had so much on your mind that when you arrived, you were not sure how you got there. <laughs> One taker here in the front row. Oh, you're starting to get more honest as we get through the list. Um, you don't know what day it is. Uh, you find your... Oh, ooh, this one, this one hurts. You find yourself jealous and angry when someone else is enjoying life. Ooh, ouch, that one hurt. You can't remember the last time you sat down to eat breakfast. Maybe you were standing, maybe you were moving while you were eating breakfast. This is one of my favourites and my pet peeves at the same time. You tweet during movies, text during dinner, read email during meetings. Full focus, people, in meetings. Or learn about your spouse's day from Facebook. Anyone? No? Okay. So God, this is, a, this is a quote from our friend Pete. He says, God gave us the gift of the Sabbath for us, knowing that cultivating a loving union with God requires time. Time that paradoxically we don't have because we're too busy serving him. The question we must wrestle with regularly is this. In what ways does my current pace of life and leadership enhance or diminish my ability to allow God's will and presence to have full scope 
of my life? It's also a dangerous question to answer. So Pete's written a very short ebook on Sabbath, and I'm going to put up a link to... Oh, thank you, team. Okay, everybody, get out your phone. We've made room for this. I would love... For, here's my challenge for this week. Scan that little QR or take a photo of it if you're slow on the scanning. And uh, my challenge is read this ebook this week. It's less... It's like... I think it's a less than 15-minute read. And uh, if you're a life group leader and you're in the room or life group 2IC, I'd love for you guys to, in your next life group over the next fortnight, have a chat about the content of this book. It's a very easy read. It's going to actually practically help us as we embark on this journey of understanding Sabbath. Just in case you still need convincing, though, uh, if it's no longer the law, why and how would we still observe the Sabbath. And so I'm just going to share a little bit of my story and hope that that helps you this morning. Um, I went through a burnout experience in August of 2020 uh, at the height of the pandemic, found it very stressful and um, ended up in hospital for five days with chest pains and the whole thing. And uh, it was after that that I started to, I kind of had the now, that was my wake-up moment, if you like, that I'd overworked for the past 20 years before that. And uh, that I thought that if I just got to be a better leader all the time, and if I got to be more efficient at the way that I ran my life and the way that I used the precious resource of time, then I would, able to, I would be able to just keep adding more to my schedule and still be able to achieve more, do more, be more, all with the great heart motivation of wanting to make the absolute most of every moment God's given me on this earth to serve him and help other people find him. But what I had to have the realisation of was that I was doing it in a very unhealthy way. And so that catalyst moment in my life is what started me on a journey of understanding and beginning to observe Sabbath. And so I'd already practiced it a little bit and what it looked like for me and us in our context, because in the 21st century, you know, it's not necessarily practical for the whole, and Pete will talk about that in the book, it's not necessarily practical for the whole community of faith to observe Sabbath on the same day, because some people work on Sundays and uh, for some people this is their work. And uh, so what we decided was Fridays would be our Sabbath day. Luke and I, we're both in ministry roles. And uh, so we would use Saturdays as the day to do all of our family life admin kind of stuff because it's six and one. God actually isn't that much interested in the Australian way of life where we have a five-day work week and then that spills over into the two days of a weekend. God said, work six days and observe the Sabbath with complete rest on the seventh. And so we had to completely turn our lives upside down to be able to start to choose which things mattered most because you can't do everything. So in 2022, I, uh, we were on a family trip to Fiji and it was a replaced trip that we'd planned, dreamed for, for years before 2020. Didn't get to take it 2020, obviously, because of the pandemic. And uh, so we we're replacing this trip in 2022 and it's April. And I was in the final year of my master's degree. I was studying my master's of leadership, which is kind of like an MBA in the churches and not-for-profit sector. And um, I, was, I had been working for, this was my sixth year. I did one subject per semester across six years because I was layering it on top of full-time work, you know, trying to keep my marriage alive and not divorced and, you know, raising four school-aged children. It was a lot. So one subject a semester was what I committed to. But this particular semester, I was working on kind of the culmination of the previous five years' worth of work into a big research project. It was kind of like the big thing that I'd been working towards for the past five years. So we're in Fiji. And I'm counting down the weeks until this big project is due at the end of June. And I'm having a conversation with God and I'm saying, God, I'm not sure how I'm going to get this done around the other things that I have to do in my life. And I just really felt strongly that God invited me <laughs> to an opportunity to really rest in him and observe the Sabbath over those 
last six or eight weeks until this big assignment was due and, um, and just to trust him with it. And so I said, okay, God, when we get back, as much as I might be tempted to use those Fridays as the extra bonus day to read or to write or to do my research to get towards this end goal that I can see, I'm going to trust you and I'm going to rest on my Sabbaths. And so I just want to put it to you as this point is that observing Sabbath helps us keep learning to honour God. Because honour is one of those things that we have to keep learning across our whole life. Because it's a sacrifice. It's something that doesn't come naturally to us. It's it's something physical that places God as being in authority over us. It's one of those things that helps us resist the temptation to make idols of our own lives by choosing all our own decisions and what we will do and where we will go and what job we will have and how we will spend our money. Honour is one of the ways that we lay it all down and say, God, I let you be Lord of my life and my money and my time. And, um, and so it was a sacrifice to continue to practice a weekly Sabbath with the mental load that I was carrying that semester. And I wasn't really talking to people about it because it was a bit of an experiment in my mind, but I felt quite vulnerable placing my trust in God rather than myself and trusting him that if I honoured him with this sacrifice, that he wouldn't leave me short and would continue to be my provider like he's always promised to be. I'll tell you this, it, it's one of the things that's grown my intimacy of my relationship with God because I had to choose to lean on him so much to hold to the resolve and the sacrifice to Sabbath one day out of every seven for those last few weeks. Which leads me to this idea, which is that observing Sabbath actually makes us grow. And I definitely grew as a leader in those few weeks because the principle of the Sabbath was always accompanied with a day of preparation. And any parent in the room will tell you that in order to take a day off, there is a lot of preparation that's required. And so for me to be able to take a day of complete rest on a Friday, I had to change which day I did my grocery shopping. I had to change which day I, did, I washed all the school uniforms. I had to change which days different things happened. I had to change which days I planned my meals in my family. The things that I'm responsible for in our household, I had to, be, I had to grow in my discipline in how I actually organised and arranged all of those things so that I could actually sacrifice a whole day to Sabbath rest. Observing Sabbath requires us to grow in all kinds of areas, organisation, discipline, awareness. Again, it's, it's just like tithing. If you don't know where your time is going, that's an area we need to grow in. It's like if you don't know where your money's going, you, you write a budget. If you don't know where your time is going, you sit down and you organise how time is spent. It's your most precious resource. God gives us everything that we need to still be activated the other six days of the week. Practically, what did this mean for me? It meant that in our family, we ordered one of those meal delivery kit um, services for those few weeks. So, you know, like they give you the fresh ingredients, but all the mental work is taken out of meal planning and grocery shopping. Like it saved so much time. So we, we invested in that for a few weeks. I had to be vulnerable and ask for help. You know, I asked Luke to take over Saturday sport with the kids so I could stay home and study on Saturdays. There were all these little tweaks that we were able to do and it actually helped us to grow in our discipline, in our level of awareness of how time was spent and how it could be used more wisely perhaps in the future. And the final thing that I think observing Sabbath is going to help us do, and it's, it's the main reason for the Sabbath, is that it's one of the things that makes room in our lives. You know, like we've just been singing, when you are actually able to lay down all your cares, concerns, routine, jobs, to-do list, emails for a whole 24-hour period a week. 
It's that action, that sacrifice that makes room for miracles, for rest and restoration, for feasting and celebration. At the end of my story of that little experiment that I went on with God for those few weeks is that the the second last weekend before my big assignment was due on the Friday, three momentous things happened in the space of four days. And they're still things that I can't really talk about publicly. They were high level things and they were all to do with church. Two of them had to be dealt with at board level with a, with a sense of immediacy. They weren't fun things like buying a church building. They were urgent things that had to be dealt with immediately. And I was blindsided. They came out of nowhere. They were completely unexpected. Just some of those things that can happen at an organisational leadership level, particularly in a church context, when you just don't expect them. And um, I was crying out to God, what is happening? I just feel so blindsided. I trusted you, God, that if I gave you this gift, this, this sacrifice of the Sabbath, and I received your gift of that rest one day a week, that everything would be okay. However, within days, I became so acutely aware that it was because I was so well rested that I had everything that I needed to bring to those difficult conversations I had over the next week. I was so aware when I was in these meetings, some of them face to face, some of them via Zoom, that it wasn't me. It was the Holy Spirit in me that was saying the right things, keeping the right tone, the right spirit, keeping offering grace and mercy to people where where I know that in my own strength, I wasn't capable of that. God was actually giving me everything that I needed for that difficult season. And I was so aware because I'd made room for him to move in my heart. So after having to put aside my assignment for essentially almost the last week before it was due, because my mind was elsewhere and we had to work on pressing issues we were facing, I again asked for help, had to humble myself, be vulnerable. I asked the team here at church to cover me for a couple of days. I asked Luke to do kids stuff for a couple of days. I went and booked myself a room in the vineyards for two nights, gave myself 48 hours alone with my phone turned off and I got it done. God gave me everything that I needed to get it done. And then we rested and we feasted and we celebrated God for everything He'd made room for in our lives over that season. All glory to God. I was so more than aware that it was nothing in my own strength that had made room for God to move in that season. So the question really is, when it comes to the Sabbath, will we choose to observe a law for the sake of religion or tradition? Or will we let God's gift of the Sabbath move our hearts toward faith? and a deeper trust in God's provision. I want to just read as we're wrapping up to you from Romans 3. And uh, it's a passage about faith and the law, what choice that we'll make. It says, Obviously the law applies to those to whom it was given, for its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. I know that's hard to hear. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. That's all it's there for. But now, everybody say, but now. God has shown us a way to be made right with Him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We're made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. This is the great egalitarian message of the gospel, that it doesn't matter where you came from. 
It doesn't matter what your prior observance of the law is or isn't. God has made a new way and it's in fact now the only way to salvation and it's through faith in God rather than observing the law. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in His grace freely makes us right in His sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and didn't punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness. For he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. So can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It is based on faith. So we're made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. After all, is God the God of the Jews only? Isn't he also the God of the Gentiles, those who weren't brought up in that tradition? Of course he is. There's only one God and he makes people right with himself only by faith, whether they are Jews or Gentiles. Well then, if we emphasize faith, does this mean that we can forget about the law? Of course not. In fact, only when we have faith do we truly fulfill the law. Only when we have faith do we truly fulfill the law. And so my heart this morning is just to bring freedom to you. Whatever your situation or circumstance is, if you're here or joining us online or watching or listening back later, my heart is freedom for God's people. Whether you're kind of bound up by a history of thinking that you had to be a certain way or live a certain way, or whether you're bound up by knowing that there's stuff there in your past that doesn't meet you know, God's glorious standard for His holy set-apart people. God's heart for you today is freedom, is for you to know that He loves you and that by faith and faith alone, you can receive every good gift that He's planned and prepared for you. And so I'm just going to ask everybody to close their eyes for a moment because some of you may like to respond today to that gift of freedom, that gift of understanding, revelation, knowing that all you need to do to receive everything God's planned for you, receive that gift of rest and feasting, the Sabbath and everything else is just simply by placing your faith in Jesus. By putting your hand up now and saying, yep, I believe. Uh, this is my, yep, I see you. I believe. This is my choice. Today's the day everything changes. I receive that gift. That's great. Anybody else? Let's pray this prayer together, church. Jesus, today I declare my faith in you. I believe you are God and that you came to earth and died so my sins could be forgiven. Today I receive your love, your acceptance, your Holy Spirit, and your plan for my life. I trust you with what's next.